the proliferation of these spiritual hymns as one way to be able to contribute to people's faith. What were you saying? I, I was, I, I didn't know at what point, you know, we'll, we'll start at whatever point, but uh, officially, but I was just uh, reflecting on, on the hymn that you were playing. And I was thinking, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have that. And, you know, 60, 70 years ago, we didn't, we didn't have it in Amharic, you know? So just reflecting on whatever hardships we do have, but then whatever the Lord is providing us through technology and through the various laborers and his harvest, you know, we, we get to just have background music that's casually, you know, singing about the Lord, yeah. you know? That's very true, very insightful. Um, so I, that said, I guess we should begin. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, brothers and sisters of Christ, uh, those of you tuning in, welcome. Um, for those of you that know, that don't know, uh, we're having now a conversation on faith in the midst of a pandemic. That is, you know, the pandemic of the COVID-19 coronavirus. And so I'm joined here. Uh, most of you know, for those of you that don't know, this is our brother, uh, Diakon Hino. Uh, hello, Diakon, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Glory to God. How are you this evening? I'm doing great. May glory be to God as well. Amen. So I was thinking um, before we began, if you could uh, start us off with a prayer. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Let us gather our thoughts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen, believing and trusting in the Holy Trinity and standing in the presence of our Holy Mother, the Church, we deny you, Satan, and for this, Madame Zion is our witness forever and ever. We thank you, O Lord, and we bless you. We lift your name up on high, and we ask that you are with us within this Gubai or within this gathering. We know that you have said whenever two or more of you are gathered that you will be there with us, so we know that you are with us today and that we are your resting place. We are your holy temple wherever we may be. And we know that you look at Yelibbaj and Mashat. You know, we know that you look at the desires of our heart and that we want to be with you in this moment of hardship, in the moment of this plague. But we know that all things pass with you. You are the anchor for us that grants us stability in chaos and in disorder. Allow us to glorify you as your son taught us by praying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With the salutation of Saint Gabriel the angel, O Our Lady Mary, peace be unto you. You are a virgin in your thoughts and a virgin in your flesh. Blessed are you amongst all women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Rejoice, joyful one, for God is with you. Um, pray and beseech your beloved Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he may grant us mercy and forgive us our sins. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diakon. Um, so having started off with the prayer, having brought our minds, as you said, gathered our, our thoughts and our, our hearts onto God, uh, I think it's just best for us to just kick off, uh, starting with the very name of our conversation. We're having a mm -hmm. conversation on, on faith in the midst of a pandemic. And so let's, we can just talk about what faith means in this time. Um, we can start off with your, with your thoughts. What are, you know, your views, your thoughts on, uh, what faith means. So I would love to present with you my thoughts. And as I read the Holy Scriptures, I found out actually that my thoughts are a little less relevant than God's thoughts. So as much as possible, hopefully I'll present that. Two things that I have been um, thinking about a lot in preparing for this discussion that we're going to have, especially this reveals kind of a little bit of my own personality or individuality as it expresses the communal responsibility of presenting God's thoughts or shapes. Uh, as you know, I'm fascinated, of course, by the scriptures, but in addition to that, languages. So I have a dictionary definition up from one of the great scholars of our church, especially of the 20th century, but you could say really all of the Ethiopian church history. That's Kidana Wal Kifle's Mazafa Sawaswa Wagus, Wamazgabakalat, or his dictionary and grammar book on the word faith. So we could look at that uh, at one moment, but 
before beginning with that, I just want to look at Hebrews 11. I'll, I'll read just the, the first few verses here from one to um, seven. Really, the whole chapter of Hebrews chapter 11 is about faith. But I'll read for us just one to seven. And I think that will be a good place to start us off. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old received divine approval. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval as righteous. God bearing witness by accepting his gifts, he died, but through his faith, he is still speaking. By faith, Enoch, or Henoch, was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was attested as having pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which comes by faith. I mean, we could write whole books on those passages without even getting into the, uh, the dictionary portion from Kidana Wal Kifle, which we, if we have time for it, we can get to it later. But here, you know, we hear of Abel or Abel, Henoch, Enoch, and Noah or Noah. And they are three exemplars or people who walked in faith, who lived out faith. So there's so many things that could be said of that. But all of this reminds me that as we read the Newer Testament, it is always an invitation for us to read and reread if we haven't uh, already the Older Testament, because, you know, what what do these testimonies or witnesses of faith, which are supposed to be examples that we understand, mean to us if we've never read about those people in the first place? So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's something to start us off with. Um, I don't know if you wanted to jump in with that or provide your own definition of faith. That's either complementary, contrary, separate, whatever it may be. No, no, no. I love, I love the insight. I think it's wonderful. Uh, you know, it's very true. Oftentimes we like to read often um, the New Testament or the Newer Testament. And then we forget about the stories of the Old Testament, uh, the story of Abel, Abel and Cain, of Enoch, uh, your namesake, or, you know, you're named after him. And then there's Noah. Uh, and it continues on, Abraham, and it goes on, Abraham and Sarah. And I think just looking at this, um, the word faith oftentimes is used so often that we forget the definition of what faith means. And so St. Paul here in Hebrews uh, gives us examples of people that are abiding by, living by a standard of faith. And so, you know, I think personally for me, what I see here when I read about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham is their trust, their loyalty to God. And so I feel like the word faith, if we were to kind of translate it into a more um, modern, more simple term, is trust in God, um, you know, loyalty to God. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love that. My uh, favorite podcast is over at the Ephesus School Network, which I had uh, recently joined with my own Tawahedo Bible study, they they focus on this theme a lot. If I could, you know, explain it in multiple ways, it's exactly what you said. It's it's trust, and even the Semitic worldview, which is the worldview of the authors of Scripture, as well as, thankfully for us, the worldview of our tradition in the Gaz right from Ethiopia and Eritrea. The Semitic worldview is one in which we don't think of things in platonic abstractions, but in practical grounded realities so that, you know, we don't delve into crazy understandings of what is truth. For example, if you go throughout the, the Bible in Giz, one of the things that stands out so immediately is we have this word hak, and 
we almost never use it. And hak really is like this abstract truth, but we never really use that word. The word that we use in the Bible is often sirk, which is righteousness, which is truth in its applied form and not, not divorced from theory, not a theoretical truth, not a truth where people try to memesadik or people try to become more righteous with each other because of different formulas they have but in an entire worldview and way of life that is not a compartmentalized you know, faith that's trapped on Sundays at a certain time and place. But here we are on the Jewish Sabbath, on the original Sabbath, and you and I are here in fellowship thinking about the Lord. And it's not restricted to this. You know? You've been doing it several times as, as, I, as well as I have been on several channels without any sort of bias towards the day. Because our Lord is not the Lord of Sunday alone. He's the Lord of every day. He's the Lord of the entire creation. So that true faith, that true trust in him means that we have not just a little bit of trust, but the utmost trust. Um, th this is where I would like to uh, go to Kidana Wal Kifle, if you don't mind. Um, here it has the word Amin, which is, you know, one, one word for faith or for truth. And the idea of, like I said, of truth and faith they're all intermingled. It says to believe, to receive, to have hope, uh, or to place your hope in something, to not doubt, to confess, to say that something is the truth, to speak the truth, to give testimony, to give witness, to say yes. All of these things are his definitions of what faith is. And it has as related words, the word mi'imen for faithful or for laity, the word aman, which we use in our, um, which we use in our hymnography or our spiritual songs. When we say aman ba aman, it's often translated in the New Testament, aman aman ibleka or aman aman iblekumu. Truly, truly, I say to you, most assuredly, I say to you, verily, verily, I say unto thee, for those who prefer the, the KJV language, um, you know, um, in, in faith, we call upon you um, to make someone believe in the faith, to make someone enter it. I mean, all of these things, even the word amen is a loan word from our sister Semitic languages, which is all tied back to this same idea of faith. It's that thing which we place to be certain. We, we are certain that this thing is the case. Um, it's not as if we're able to, you know, astral project outside of our bodies and look at everything in the most objective way in which God can or in which we might get a, a view of, you know, during the resurrection. But it's that with our limited understanding, with the knowledge that we've been given, especially the, the Holy Scriptures in the tradition that they came in and interpretation, so that we can be saved, that gives us enough information, we place our utmost trust, our superlative trust in that. Mm. That's very true. And, you know, I was just uh, hearing the definitions you were uh, listing for us of faith. Yeah. And one of them that caught me was hope. Hope. And drawing it back to Hebrews, right? In the beginning of Hebrews, St. Paul tells us that faith is the hope and the confidence, the assurance of things unseen. And Another thing that also, uh, you know, stood to me, stood out to me was you were talking about how now it's today is Saturday. It's yeah. not typically a day we go to church on. And here we are talking about uh, the Lord because all days are the Lord. It's not just okay. Sunday and not just days, but also all locations are the Lord or belong to the Lord. So just bringing it back now to the time of this pandemic, we're here in our homes. And I think a lot of us were not able to come to church because mm -hmm. You know, public authorities have said, you know, limit on public gatherings and, 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 you know, so forth. And so I think for a lot of us, it really doesn't matter the age, we have the temptation to kind of cast off the contemplation on God, mm -hmm. worship of God, because we're here stuck in our homes. And I think it's wonderful that you talk about how faith is so many things. And most importantly, it's trusting God as a way of life. It's a hope for that which is unseen the invisible God, and that we have to live that love, that trust of the unseen God every day, even in our homes, even when it's not Sunday. So uh, what do you, what, what do you think? I mean, if you wanted to add on on that, those are just, I, I think that's absolutely right. And um, <laughs> just as a funny form of feedback, uh, 
without tooting our own horns too much, you know, when we look at ourselves, you and I, as individuals amongst our peers, there are certain attributes or or actions that we've taken that make people think, oh man, I wish I was more like that. And it's almost like, it's almost like people lose that hope that you're so beautifully, you know, waxing poetically about because they think, oh, you know what? That level of hope or that level of faith is just for Mirat and Henok and, you know, Gale and the Galit. It's not necessarily for me. I'm on a different level. I, I hear this feedback a lot because they see levels of mastery. But I want to introduce here, even though here the, the faith, one of the definitions Kidana will Kifle lay down is or not doubting. I'm going to throw in my own personal territory. I, I am someone who is trying to walk on this journey of faith, trying to have hope in things unseen, trying to bury myself in the word, trying to give my Saturdays, my Sundays, my every day to the Lord. And yet tomorrow is Palm Sunday in the Orthodox Church. Yeah. It's Hosanna. It's yeah. Hosanna. Yeah. And I want to yell, Hosanna, Mirti, Ntabuna Dawid. I want to say, you are the recognized one of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have so many unique parts of our liturgy yeah. on the yeah. day of Palm Sunday. And, and in my heart of hearts, I got to be honest with you. I'm like, God, could you at least let us celebrate Hosanna? And it's like, well, no, <laughs> the answer is no, not right now. And, you know, Lord willing or God willing, we'll have many more Hosannas to celebrate in our life. If he allows and he permits and, and we're able to live, we'll have plenty of Palm Sundays to celebrate. But in me, I have this deep desire to do that, even though I'm trying to walk this line of hope in things unseen and, and have this strong faith and trust that God is, is working. Uh, I would like, you know, a part of Henok would like to celebrate Kadasi Gorgorios, but <laughs> I can't. And so part of working out this hope and faith is that I have to grapple with that, that reality. And I just wanted to put that out there to shed some light that, you know, it's not all hunky dory. It's not all alga by alga or mattress by mattress or bed by bed. It's not all soft pillows. It's not, definitely not. And I mean, you gave, uh, a wonderful example, but I mean, if we want to take it all the way, um, one of the 12 apostles of Christ, Thomas, was filled with doubt when his mm -hmm. Lord was crucified, when his Lord uh, died. And in the midst of that darkness, even he, that one of the 12 disciples, one of the 12 chosen ones, was full of doubt. But what it's not about the doubt that comes into our hearts, but what we do when the doubt comes into our hearts, what we do with that doubt. If we can turn it into faith, like Thomas did, which ultimately took him all the way into mart martyrdom, then all the better for us. So I think, I mean, this is definitely tough times, especially for us that love the, the church service, but there are things we can use to comfort ourselves. You know, whether it's the live streams that are, the church gives to people that tune in online, whether it's the word of God, which is available to us at any time and any hour, uh, whether it's the fasting that we can uh, nourish ourselves with um, at every hour of the day. So I think, we have tools and we just need to pray that God opens our eyes to see those tools, I think. I like that counterintuitive last point. I'm gonna ask you to flesh that out a little bit, brother, if I could flip the question right back at you. You yeah. said nourish ourselves with fasting. Yeah. That is a beautiful, like biblical way of speaking that I think is gonna go over some people's heads. Well, what do you mean by that? Because it okay, seems well, counterintuitive. Okay, well, I, thank you for that question. Um, I think especially for a lot of us, uh, we are very concerned with the exercise and the nourishment of the body. We like to either eat good food or eat healthy food. Uh, we like to either indulge in some of our personal you know, bodily um, desires, or we like to um, exercise our body. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of all that, in the midst of caring for the body, oftentimes we forget that there is a soul within each and every single one of us. And that soul also needs to be taken care of. And so fasting, our fathers teach us, is food for the soul. It's food for the soul. And so especially for those of us in quarantine that say, oh, I'm sorry, I have, I have practice. I have athletic practice, so I can't fast. I got to eat. Or for those of us that say, oh, I'm working, I can't fast. Well, now we have no excuse. We're here <laughs> in our homes. So now I was saying is now God has opened our eyes for a lot of us 
that maybe don't have the opportunity to fast or maybe want to make excuses for fasting to start nourishing our souls, to start feeding the soul for exchange because the soul gets hungry as well. And I've seen at least personally for myself how much fasting can be a beautiful thing. I myself have reaped a lot of benefits from fasting. And I know that I can continue, you know, making that fasting an even more beautiful experience. There's certainly a long road ahead of me. But for all of us, since we're just talking here, fasting is a wonderful thing because it is nourishment for the soul. Um, and so we should treat fasting just like food. We can't go without food. We can't go without fasting. They're both necessities for humans. So that's, that's just all I was trying to say. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and in the Sermon on the Mount, of course, we see, especially, you know, throughout Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that the fasting is inherently intertwined and interlinked with the prayer and the almsgiving. Yep. And one of the things that a lot of people are saying, like you said, God is putting the pressure on us. He is calling us out on our potential phoniness, on our potential baloney. If we say that we are have all these litany of reasons for why we're, we can't fast, all these litany of reasons why we don't have time to pray, all these litany of reasons for why we can't give alms, we're saving money on the gas, we're going out less, so we're, eat, we're spending less money on eating, we have more time with our families, we have more time for prayer, we have more time for fasting. It's like God is giving us a final test and he's like oh you need time here's all the time you could ever ask for what are you going to do with it yeah i totally agree i mean i was listening to a podcast um a while ago about fasting and you know there is now scientific research that proves that fasting is actually good for the body which seem which may seem counterintuitive because we're robbing it of food but in fact actually in a way fasting actually allows for us to have a stronger body and this is something that our you know our ethiopian fathers and mothers our orthodox fathers and mothers have long said for generations i mean we have fathers that have been fasting their whole lives reaching the 90s reaching even the, the triple digits so fasting you know fasting it has the purpose of distracting the body uh, distracting the, the body distractions but it also has some benefits as well but most importantly the the, the greatest benefit is it allows for our soul to be nourished, as I said before. It allows for our soul to focus on God. And like you said, fasting and prayer go hand in hand. You, you know, the fasting without prayer simply becomes a hunger strike. Mm -hmm. And prayer without fasting is extremely hard to do. Prayer without fasting simply becomes words. So we have to use both of them in order to offer a pure sacrifice um, to God. So uh, thank you for pointing out those benefits for those of us that are, might be reluctant to, to put our feet inside the cold water of fasting, those are some good benefits to start out uh, and convince ourselves to enter fasting. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. And the the research doesn't stop there. It is beautiful. I've, I've been looking to that a lot. You know, people call it anti-aging or longevity research, and they do. It's very well documented, even in a time like this. You know, it's no magic wand, but it does even help with the immune system, you know, which is something you would like to boost. So it's brilliant that even that, and I, I would go further to say, you know, some of the research that people have, have done at, you know, the sources of holy water and the sources of things like our holy oil, these, these things have these ultimate meanings and spiritual truths that we hold as the highest part, but on a more like grounded practical reality there are physical benefits to them too and it's like you know you're getting your local two for one special except it's, it's from god and so you know that's just another reason for us to remain grateful you know for the many things we have you know shelter over our head clothes to wear food to still eat and it, it gives us an opportunity to reach out to members of of our own parish you know I, I like you know movements that are more localized than uh, on a global scale and and i think you know without getting into the you know the politics of the matter s some of the interconnectedness on a global scale is part of what is you know to blame of the extent to which this epidemic you know there have always been plagues throughout humanity you know we, we yeah. haven't been the cleanliest beings on on planet earth so there have always been plagues but the the kind of widespreadness of this and the interconnectedness or the globalization of the world is is part of why 
why that's happening. So it, it almost gives us an opportunity to do the opposite of that, which is to look more local and to see if we are doing all right, you know, financially, physically, spiritually, and we're super healthy and we're rich in that sense. The Bible is always telling us to give our riches away. So the question is, what can we do as individuals at a local level in reaching out to the people that are on our phones, the people that we know to be members of our parish, and then even outside of that, even the, the members of our of our neighborhood, um, in the safest and most responsible way, while still you know maintaining sanitary procedures, what can we do? You know, what kind of calls to action can there be so that we're still taking care of the needy neighbor? in this time so that we're giving this witness forever and ever. Very true. And I would also submit to you that the most local thing you can do is uh, look within ourselves. Cause sometimes we have our eyes out to others so much that we forget what's happening with ourselves. And so this is an opportunity, even a blessing I would say for us to have a check-in and what better time to do so than Holy Week. I mean, just looking at it from the, from the canon, from the tradition, if there is any time for fasting that is recommended by our church, Holy Week is, I think it's the time where the most fasting is recommended. I think uh, our church recommends fasting until the 13th hour for each day of Holy Week, which I think that's seven o'clock, right? 7 p.m. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So almost every day becomes a fasting season, a self-check-in season, a contemplation on God season uh, during this Holy Week. And also, like you said, it's also a time for us to check into those around us because we forget that often in this era of just, you know, looking at what's happening on the social media, on mass media uh, and, and whatnot. So I think that's great. That's right. What, what you said calls to mind something that our blessed bishop, Abu Nabarnavas, often has said. He's especially mentioned this analogy or illustration or misale during one of his Paschal homilies a few years ago. And that analogy is, is quite simple. It's, it's one that is, is a little bit uh, of a privilege for people to understand. But for those who've ever had the privilege of flying, they know that when you're up there, the breathing apparatus that you're supposed to put before you go and try to aid someone else, you have to make sure that you're breathing properly. Otherwise, you might make a mistake in taking care of that person. And so, as you said, we need to make sure before trying to... Uh, push our spirituality elsewhere, the most local church or resting place of the most high God is ourselves. Yeah. And so we got to make sure that that breathing apparatus is aided through the fasting and the prayer and the almsgiving, the paying attention to the, to the church canons and to the church literature. Many people have PDFs nowadays. If, if anyone would like, I have a, a PDF in English and one in um, Amharic and Giz, which different people have been sending to me about some of the readings, uh, whether it's from the Coptic tradition or our own specific Giz, right, tradition of, you know, what's going on in, in the church and, and although we can't celebrate things exactly as it is, it, it does behoove us on our own time to look into these things. And sometimes I know you and I would look into these things a little bit more than, than the average person. But I think everyone could spend a little bit more time with the time that they have now to try to see what is the language of the church? What is, what is the spirit of the church? Especially, like you said, during this week. And I, I just want to jump in here again, because I am a, a, a fan of languages. It's always been interesting to me that in the Western tradition, they do refer to it as Holy Week, and yet we call it Samuna Hemamat, yeah. or the time of the sufferings. And that's, that's always stood out to me as, as one kind of Ethiopic or Giz imprint or status. It's, it's almost like every little other shared calendar thing that we have, we have it, and, and, and it's not exactly the same, but it's mostly the same. And then we always have this, this peculiar unique way of saying it ourselves mm, very true and that, that actually i think uh can transition us into the next thing i mean um tomorrow is like you said Hosanna, and then starting from then is someone hamama the time of suffering it's more commonly known as holy week um and then that takes us all the way to Monday thursday again that's a western term but you know when we commemorate the the last supper and the washing of the feet and then we have good friday when our Lord's crucified and, and the, the feasts go on. And so I think for, for some of us, we may be almost overwhelmed by the amount of content 
by the amount of, of feasts that are you know happening all in the period of one week. And so in what little time we have, um, cause this could go on for, for thousands of years, meditating on the suffering of Christ. I wanted to see, um, some of the things that you wanted to say concerning Hosanna, concerning Samun Hamamat, concerning suffering of Christ, um, so that we could just make it just a little clear for some of us as we're entering this, this time of, of meditation and contemplation. Yeah. So, um, I guess I'll touch on two things and I'll, I'll leave it to, to you to maybe even close out after that. Mm, I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit more depth with a, I have a couple different Bible study groups I'll be doing tomorrow, actually. Um, some in Seattle and then our own folks here in Los Angeles. But one of the topics I'm going to discuss with them, and it's the biggest, I think, theme going into it, is this idea of the kingship of Jesus Christ and his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, that is. So when Jesus is coming in, remember how he's born. He can be born with the full majesty of heaven. He doesn't need a teenage woman. He, he doesn't need shepherds. He doesn't even need a barn or anything. He could come with the full might of legions of angels and upon uh, tr trumpets and just the, the full terror that he could come with, the awesomeness that he could come with. Instead, he decides to rest humbly in the womb of a virgin and with full humility come in. Be quiet for 30 years for the most part and teach only for three years. And within that three-year period, towards the culmination of that three-year period, he chooses not to come with a battle horse to destroy the Roman Empire um, with physical violence, but he comes with a donkey, mm. with an ahiyah. There are other English words in different translations of the Bible that I will not even use in this space because of how taboo they have become. And the very fact that they have become taboo shows how great the humility of the author of life was for him to ride on that animal. Again, if I may quote our blessed Bishop Barnabas, he often says, people love, especially in Amharic, but also in English, to call you these taboo English words or ahiyya. And he says, if someone is to ever call you that, you should say, Amen. That is the animal which was glorified when my Lord, my Savior, my God, my King entered into Jerusalem, as the children said, Hosaina save us. So the kingship of the Lord was shown not through a physical insurrection or rebellion against the Romans, which later on in 70 AD led to the destruction of the Second Temple and the scattering of that Jewish Christian community that was there led by the brother of the Lord, Bishop James or Bishop Jacob. No, he came and entered with a kingship that showed loving submission unto death, sacrificial love. So even in his entrance that is called triumphant, his view of triumph, his view of victory is totally different than the typical uh, one that is concocted by, by human philosophies, by human strategies of victory. And it's so simple that even the children that you and I often teach on Sundays through our homilies can understand it. You don't need to be a PhD or a master's degree. You don't need to be super deacons or priests to understand it. Jesus Christ came humbly on a donkey. He didn't come in a Corvette. He didn't come in a monster truck. He didn't come on his battle horse with legions. He came to show how to lovingly submit, not only to his, his beloved, whom they thought were beloved, his close apostles, but to people who were considered his enemies, who he wanted to reconcile and bring together. He said, as I and you are one, referring to God the Father, please make them one, unite them. Tawahadu adragacho, awahadacho. Make them one, make them one, make them united. And to further show and stress this humility on Monday, Thursday, as you said, was Alotahamus, the prayer of Thursday. One of the great traditions 
that is kept in all of the old legacy apostolic churches, right? Orthodox and Catholic is something that still makes you cry and something that up until very recently in Ethiopia, I'd have to go check to see if it still exists, but up until very recently in Ethiopia, especially in the countryside, was a great honor that people would do as people enter your homes. And that is to get on the ground and to wash your feet. I, I, I can't, I'm always crying thinking about it, but every time that procedure happens, you just realize like the person who made the heavens and the earth wanted to do this for us. It just, like you said, when God took away our excuses for not wanting to do the holy things during this time, the fact that our Lord Jesus washed the apostles' feet takes away any excuse that we have not to be humble because we are nothing like him. We are way below him. And yet he showed all this humility, all of this humility that we should be showing. And if you remember the reaction of Petros, it's sometimes a reaction that some of us will even happen. Mm-hmm. We have a matatab sinasarat that we do. We like to wash hands. One of the tasks of the deacon is to wash the hands of the clergy. And sometimes some members of the clergy, whether they be deacons or priests or whatever, may say one to another, oh no, please don't wash my hands. And yet when Peter said, don't wash my hands or don't wash my feet to the Lord, the Lord said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. You have no union with me. And then so Peter went the opposite direction. Often he's, he's prone to hyperbole. He'll go, uh, there's a great word of Father Paul Tarazzi uses. He says he tergiversates or he oscillates. He goes back and forth like this and that. So on one end, he said, don't wash me. On the other end, he says, wash my whole body, wash everything. And so I, I remember that faith with which Peter asked the Lord to wash everything in him. And I think that we should ask the Lord to wash away all of our pride so that we may approximate or get closer to the level of humility he showed in entering Jerusalem and the level of humility he showed in washing the feet of the apostles. I mean, that's, that's a powerful message. I think anything, any one of us can, can learn from. I think pride has been taught by our fathers to be the root and the chief of all sin. And it is the cause of the fall of Lucifer, who was the most powerful angel. He became Satan because of pride. And Adam's fall was also because of pride. Um, and thus the fall of all of creation. And so if pride is the chief of sin, then that means that it's counter. Humility, that is, must be the chief of virtue. And that's why our Lord makes an emphasis on humility throughout his life. His birth, like you said, was from a place of humility, his teaching, his clothes, everything, the the way he walked and lived was from a place of humility. And ultimately his entrance in Jerusalem and his passion was also from a place of humility. So that's something we should all try our best to follow. What I got from, from Hosanna and, and from this someone Hamama that awaits us is a a paradox, but that's nothing to be surprised at because Christianity is a faith of paradox. Um, But the paradox that I saw was the unity between humility and glory. Because what Christ did was not only did he humble himself, but he made that humility a cause for our glory. He turned humility and he flipped the whole definition of what glory meant. And so him in his divinity, him in his godship, his kingship, his triumphant nature to humble himself can only mean one thing, and that is humility for us is our glory. And that goes all the way to the cross. The cross, um, you know, historians tell us, was a scandalous thing, a scandalous thing. Even for Christians, it was hard to swallow that the cross was going to be the symbol of Christianity. For the first couple of decades, it was a fish that was used as a symbol of Christianity. And so it was only until the horror of the cross had been erased partially from the mind of humans that the cross began to be used in Christian art and iconography. And so now people are wearing necklaces. People are wearing clothes that's embroidered with the cross. The cross being the ultimate sign of humility, the ultimate sign of humiliation, 
And now it became our glory. It's the glory of bishops and priests, even presidents, even world leaders, even kings now use the cross as a symbol of glory. And so the glory of the cross is a glory that we must all try to pursue. Because our Lord said, he who exalts himself, he who puts himself up, he's going to be humiliated. But the person that humbles himself, he will become glorified. And so now in this pandemic, just bringing it back here to 2020, because you know we are talking about things that unfolded 2,000 years ago. Here in 2020, we have all been humbled one way or another. We've been seen, we, our vulnerability has been shown to us, whether we like it or not. We're forced in our homes because of a disease that we can't fight with our fists. And so in the midst of this pandemic, where we're humbled in our homes, we must realize that our Lord was also humbled. Our Lord was also humiliated, but he turned that humiliation into a cause of glory. And so we should use the suffering and the humiliation that we're seeing as a cause for glory, as a cause for union with the one who was crucified for us. And I think if we can do that, then we can find meaning in these dark times. And it can also make it easier for us to bow down our heads and wash the feet of others. Um, and so a very powerful message, Yago. Amen. Amen. Likewise. I, I miss these conversations. You know, uh, people don't understand we're recording this now, but for us, this is our, our regular uh, post liturgical conversations with Deacon uh, Mahira Tendai and um, <laughs> usually cut short by, by us having to part ways. But I'm, I'm glad that other people got to participate with us and, and maybe we'll be able to check into their feedback and, and see how how we can incorporate that again. Thank you for inviting me to this space and I'm sure we'll meet again like this soon. Thank you. Thank you very much Reverend, you know, for the wonderful insight for, uh, for this wonderful conversation that we've had and uh, I look forward to it as well. Uh, so may God be with you. Amen. Uh, Amen. May God bless your ministry. And just as we began with prayer, I was wondering if you could also end us. Uh, <laughs> 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 How are you saying? Because you, you know, the elder. Oh, no. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, you are a gracious God who has shed your grace upon us. In fact, you've given us grace upon grace. We ask that you are with us in the time of this pandemic, that you grant us the ability to understand the gravity and the seriousness of what is going on but at the same time to make sure that we don't get overly stressed and overly anxious. You told us not to be anxious about tomorrow, but to let tomorrow worry for itself. So we ask you to remove all doubts from us so that we may have our utmost superlative trust, trust to the upteenth degree in you, that ultimate faith in you, so that you can ground us, so that you can guide us in everything that we do. We know that you are not just the God of Sunday, but you are the God of every day. So allow us to remember that and allow us to make the events that transpired 2000 years ago that we remember and commemorate every year relevant to us in the here and now. Allow us to be blessings for one another so that your name could be lifted up on high and glorified in every time and in every place until our ending breath or until you come again to judge the living and the dead. May the love of God the Father and the grace of the Son and the communion of the Holy Spirit remain with us all forever. Amen. Thank you. Shichadik Amen. 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 To those of you who are tuning, thank you very much, uh, and goodbye. May God be with all of you. Until next time.